It has been a minute since I last wrote about One Piece, but I assure you, if the progress bar of this video didn't assure you already, that's not for lack of things to say. During and after the creation of that first video, I fell deep into this series, only emerging from my blackout binge after the time skip gave me an excuse to take a break. The trouble is, by the time that happened, there were just so many topics swirling around in my head that I didn't know where to start. One Piece is just too powerful for its own good, man. There is nothing else like it. Closing in on 20,000 pages of gorgeous, charming manga illustrations, all rendered in service of some of the funniest, most imaginative and compelling writing in the business. There are so many good things to say about this series that when you start laying it all out, it kind of sounds like you're exaggerating or making things up to justify the frankly absurd amount of time you've invested into it already. But it is really that good. I mean, here I am thinking about doing it all again. I need to go back and reread some earlier sagas to jog my memory for future video essays. But also, I just miss those parts of this unfathomably massive world and I want to see them again. One Piece isn't just a very good, very long story. It's a place built of words, ideas, and images that you get sucked into and stuck in. I have been isekai'd by this damn manga. We One Piece fans are all trapped in another world. Seriously, if you're still on the outside, I am warning you, do not come in here. It is as inescapable as Impel Down. Just look at that last sentence. I can't even form similes that make sense to the outside world anymore. But oh, what a world I'm in now. A sprawling and sparkling sea of possibilities stretching out in all directions as far as the eye can see and beyond. Each new land over the horizon promising stranger sights and more thrilling adventures than the last. Eiichiro Oda does not waste the vast volume of volumes this manga takes up. He uses every page and panel he can to expand on and enrich this fantastical universe, detailing its twisted and complex history, the systems that govern it, and the infinitely varied cultures and peoples that inhabit its isolated islands. There are few worlds in fiction as colossal, comprehensive, and cohesive as that of One Piece. Few stories with this many moving, interlocking parts. It is matched only by absolute titans of genre fiction. Dune, The Lord of the Rings, The Universal Century, Earthsea, and understanding the scope of that world and how Oda went about constructing it is one of the keys to understanding how this series has managed to stand as the king of our world's most competitive comic market for over two decades now. Of course, I have only read up to a little ways past the series halfway point, so my own comprehension of that world is far from complete. But the relatively light and breezy half-world of paradise is going to give me more than enough to talk about until Oda's finished filling in the rest. As is advisable with most things this huge and deep, One Piece drops us in at the shallow end, though you wouldn't know it to look around. East Blue is already a wild and wacky place full of colorful characters, threatening villains, bizarre concepts, and big ideas. Separated by unruly expanses of ocean, each island Luffy visits on his quest to recruit a crew has its own unique identity in architecture and dress, its own culture and customs, yet they are all connected by trade and travel, not to mention their shared reliance on the navy for protection. For there be pirates in these here waters, scalawags and scoundrels whose names alone make civilized folk quake with fear. Iron Mace Alvida, Don Krieg the Invincible, Kuro of the Hundred Plans, each one capable of devastating a whole island community on their own, and those are just the regular folk. Scariest of all is our- ah, oh, that's getting old. Scariest of all is Arlong, a mighty fishman warrior who can throw a whole house one-handed and seeks to one day subjugate every human on this vast blue sea under his superior race's rule. Though that is but an echo of a much greater injustice, the full scale of which won't become apparent for hundreds of chapters yet. 
This arc also introduces us to these things called devil fruits, naturally occurring magical treasures of the sea that render those who eat them unable to swim, but in exchange transform those people into, well, just about anything you can imagine. From a stretchy inflatable rubber man, to living avatars of the elements, to battle furries. These fruits range in potency, but even the most seemingly simple power, like detachable limbs, can be deadly in the wrong disembodied hands. And Buggy the Clown is but one superpowered pretender of many to the long empty throne of the Pirate King, Gold D. Roger, who kickstarted this new golden age of piracy with his final breath on the Executioner's Block, where he declared to the world that all his treasure could be found where he left it in one piece, waiting at the end of the fabled Grand Line. But that's a long ways off when we first hear of it. For a hundred chapters, two years of publication, East Blue was the entire world for Luffy and his crew. From the traveling restaurant Barati to the weird island of rare animals that the equally weird Gaimon calls home to the bustling, danger-fraught streets of Rogue Town, it feels to a new reader like a place with endless potential for future adventure. But then, at long last, the Straw Hats reach the starting line of their real journey, and the looming scale of this whole thing becomes frighteningly apparent for the first time. East Blue is a tutorial zone larger and more detailed than the full worlds of many other manga. It exists to give the Straw Hats a place to find their footing before thrusting them into the unpredictable insanity of the Grand Line, and it serves a similar purpose for us as an audience. It establishes the essential high concepts that will define combat and conflict throughout the series, including one that a lot of people mistake for a retcon, because after the first chapter it doesn't explicitly come up again for another 200 or so. Everything you need to know to follow the series' fights is laid out here in detail, along with the power dynamics that shape its grander conflicts. We learn that there are pirates both virtuous and villainous in this world, and that they all exist in defiance of a massive military superpower whose reach spans all the shining seas. That power appeals to young idealists who believe the heroic hype of its propaganda about bringing order to the oceans, while higher-ups with fewer scruples use its authority to control and terrorize ordinary folk. And when it's profitable, they'll even turn a blind eye to pirates doing the same. It's a little clunky to front load all this exposition, but it's also necessary because the Grand Line operates on its own complicated layer of rules that serves to make each island within it a world unto itself. And the series needs all the breathing room it can buy itself to explore those wildly varied settings. At the same time, delaying its introduction by a hundred chapters sets the Grand Line up as this legendary place that the end of the map reveals, a gauntlet that chews up and spits out all but the hardiest buccaneers, a goal unto itself. But it's only legendary till Oda makes it real, and by spending the next uh, 20 some odd years fleshing out that place, I think it's safe to say that he managed to pay off that buildup and then some. So what makes the Grand Line so special? Where do I even begin? I guess it might help to define it. The Grand Line is a stretch of sea that straddles the entire equator, its current running perpendicular to the red line of rocky monocontinent that also encircles the globe north to south. Together, these lines split the rest of the world into four vast oceans, east, south, west, and north blue, that are physically separated from the Grand Line by the Calm Belts. Which sound pretty pleasant, right? Well, the Calm Belts are actually the scariest places on the planet, nothing but miles upon miles of dead, sunny ocean where no winds blow above the waves, and those waves only roll in the first place because of the coiling bodies of countless colossal sea kings nesting just beneath them. They're a sailor's worst nightmare, but they've got nothing on the strange sea that lies between them, which can only be accessed in one direction by sailing up a mountain, 
And that is just the start of the weirdness. East Blue operated like one would expect an ocean to operate, or at least a cartoon fantasy ocean full of delightful half-flamingo sea monsters. Tides roll, compass points north, wind blows, ship goes. Simple mechanism by which piratical adventures can be reached. Why fix what ain't broke, say you. What? Eiichiro Oda calls back from deep within the bowels of the mechanics of seafaring where he sits tinkering like a madman. See, you don't just get two straight lines of eternally still seawater out of nowhere. That's just not how weather or oceans work. And the cause of the calm belts seems to be a clash between the normal oceanic atmosphere of the blue seas and whatever crazy bullshit is happening in the Grand Line. Here, you can be sailing under warm, sunny skies one minute and crashing up against ice flows the next. And those erratic weather patterns create four different kinds of islands, eternally stuck in winter, spring, summer, and fall, each of which experiences its own seasonal cycle with the rest of the globe, meaning there are a total of 16 different seasons to contend with in these waters. Such wild, localized variation in temperature and pressure causes the winds of the Grand Line to blow every which way, while sea currents swirl unpredictably below. It's easy to get lost in these waters, and easier still to die if you try to navigate them without the right skills and the right equipment. But there are upsides to that. Like, you know how compasses are just fundamentally a little disappointing? They always point north, and that is super useful, don't get me wrong, but wouldn't it be better if they pointed where we're going instead? Oda found a way to fix that. Every island on the Grand Line has its own magnetic field, so regular compasses just won't cut it here. The only way to navigate is with a log pose, a programmable compass that can be attuned to the specific magnetic frequency of any island by spending a variable amount of time in a nearby port. The cumulative effect of these details is that the Grand Line is kinda one massive stage select screen. Strings of isolated islands connected by the log pose, each one totally distinct from the last in climate, culture, and ecology. Each new place can be whatever the heck Oda wants it to be, basically. So long as it fits on an island, any concept is plausible in this setting. And what an island even is can be a very fungible concept. It is a truly limitless world-building setup, though the Straw Hats do start out in fairly conventional territory. The Alabasta Saga takes them through a Wild West-themed island full of bounty hunters in disguise before depositing them on Little Garden, a lost world full of ancient beasts where two old Viking giants brawl to a draw on a daily basis to settle their ancient beef. But on a basic level, it's cowboys and dinosaurs. Simple, classic stuff. These first two arcs are more tone-setting pieces than anything else. They establish that unscrupulous humans can be just as big a threat as the elements on these wild seas, show us how far the Baroque Works conspiracy reaches, and drop hints about the land of giants, Elbaf, which will come up later and serves as an aspirational legend in its own right for Usopp. We spend quite a bit more time in the next two locations, getting to know their inhabitants and learning their local history. Alabasta especially is as vividly realized a setting as you will find in manga, but the Drum Kingdom has its own lengthy history too. This saga also does a ton to flesh out the Devil Fruit power system by subdividing the fruits into three classes. Elemental Logia fruits being the most powerful, Paramecias, which give general random superpowers, generally being the least, and Zoan fruits, the ones what turn you into a furry, sitting somewhere in the middle. Also, also, the ancient crone Dr. Kareha's eternally rockin' bod may be at least in part a product of hockey, but that's jumping into theory territory. All of that is absolutely fascinating. Do not get me wrong. I could fill a whole video essay talking about any of these topics, but what I would rather talk about right now are all the critters we meet while we're learning all those details. Because in addition to just being generally great at world building, Oda is really, really good at cooking up cool critters. 
big critters, small critters, cute critters, kung fu fighting critters. There are so many delightfully strange animals adorning the pages of this manga. The entirety of One Piece's telecommunications network runs on various breeds of radio-sensitive snail, and that's just the teeniest tip of the iceberg. Oda really lets his imagination run wild when he's conceiving of wildlife. Some of his critters are more on the dangerous side, like the pack-hunting gorilla rabbits chilling up on Drum Mountain and crocodiles' pet banana gators. Others are useful as transportation. Miss All Sunday drives a smaller gator, and at one point the straw hats scuttle across the desert on the back of a giant crab. On that note, the super spot-billed duck is just the greatest animal ever, Karoo is my boy, and I would both kill and die for him. Don't fucking test me. All this unique fauna and accompanying flora helps to sell the idea that we're truly in another world with its own ever-evolving ecosystem. And those riding animals in particular, along with other novel modes of transportation designed around the unique features of each location we visit, allow Oda to explore how natural history affects and intersects with human history. Each civilization we find on the Grand Line is fundamentally shaped by the geography it occupies and the unique means by which people navigate that terrain, be it with man-made tools or indigenous animals in much the same way that cars and horses have shaped our civilizations here on Earth. Alabasta is a prime example. Camels are the lifeblood of its trade and transportation networks, while the swifter riding ducks allow the nation's military to reach places faster when needed. And the fact that everything is so spread out and hard to reach in Alabasta is exactly what allows Crocodile to hide his operation there. On the subject of cover-ups, today's sponsor, Keeps, can help you avoid having to do one of your own. Hair loss is an unfortunate fact of life. Two out of three individuals who are designated male at birth will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. And while history is full of brave people who've proven bald can be beautiful, not everyone has the determination and patience for push-ups needed to go full Saitama. Many of us just really want to keep our hair, but without help, that desire can lead you down to some dark places. Between apexes of manliness like Krillin and the internationally agreed upon start of the hairstyle spectrum, the Vegeta, there exists a no-go zone of hair distribution known colloquially as the Ugly Bastard Valley, a place nobody wants to visit but where many end up without a guide. With a wig or comb over, you can possibly climb your way back out, but you can just as easily end up digging yourself deeper into the pit. Your best bet is to never go down there to begin with. Luckily, modern science has given us proven treatments that can delay or prevent the balding process before it progresses too far. And Keeps has revolutionized the way we access those treatments. When you sign up for their service, they'll connect you with an online doctor who will review your info and prescribe a plan that's right for your needs. Keeps will then deliver those prescriptions directly and discreetly to your door. Plans start as low as 10 bucks a month, and for a limited time, if you go to keeps.com slash basement, you can get 50% off your first order. So you can see for yourself why they have more five-star reviews than any of their competitors. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, head to keeps.com slash basement today. It's not just the geography and history of these places that makes them so interesting. It's also the volatile political situations we're thrust into when we arrive there. We find both Alabasta and the Drum Kingdom in states of revolution, one provoked by a despot's disregard for his people, the other motivated by misinformation. King Cobra of Alabasta sincerely wants what's best for his people, but not at the expense of neighboring islands who might suffer droughts themselves if he used dance powder to bring the rain back to his land. And Crocodile uses this conflict to drive a wedge between him and his needy people, hoping to ignite a coup. But if Cobra's considerate nature marks him as an exception among the allied leaders of the world government, then Wapole is the rule that exception proves. He is a gluttonous, greedy, self-centered tyrant who hoards his kingdom's resources, in this case its unparalleled medical expertise, and uses them to control his people in turn. To him, they're all just disposable tools. 
Yet for a long time, those people are largely complacent in the face of that unfairness because at least their leader protects them from the dangers of the outside world. It's only after one of those dangers arrives at their doorstep and Wapple turns tail that they begin to see the truth. And this reflects the general attitude we see among the citizens of just about every island under world government occupation, from the East Blue Boonies to Sabaudi Archipelago. Ordinary people are easily plied by Navy propaganda because it reassures them that they live in a safe and, most importantly, just world. But if people like Wapole are calling the shots, then that obviously can't be the whole story. And with every step the Straw Hats take through the Grand Line, the hypocrisy and deception behind that so-called justice becomes increasingly clear. Crocodile is by far the worst villain we've met so far. Jaded, condescending, he kills without hesitation anyone who gets in his way, unless he's really pissed at them, in which case he'll torture them for the fun of it. He is a cruel, unscrupulous monster, and yet he has the full support of the world government as one of their official privateers, the Shichibukai. It's only when he's actively engaged in sedition against that government that he needs to hide any of his crimes. So long as they fight the Navy's enemies when asked and do some nominal bounty hunting on the side, the seven warlords of the sea are allowed to get away with, well, basically anything they want, including murder. Boa Hancock sustains her island's population by plundering with impunity, though she doesn't actually need anyone's permission, because she is beautiful. Don Quixote do Flamingo runs a thriving slave market, and Gecko Moria routinely kidnaps random seafarers to fuel his ever-growing zombie army with zero consequence, while Luffy's bounty gains an extra load of berries every time he helps someone. It is a self-evidently unjust system. But that doesn't really matter to the world government, because all they really care about is maintaining their own power. Justice is just the label they use to legitimize it. Which is pretty easy to do when you control the only global newspaper and can spin politically motivated public executions, wars you start, and genocides you commit, uh, buster calls you make, any way you want. Not to mention when you have courts that will declare anyone you send their way for any reason to be guilty with no questions asked. And as for the stuff that can't be justified with justice, like the slave trade that's supposedly been outlawed even though the ruling class still uses slaves for everything, well, that's where the plausibly deniable criminal empires of the Shichibukai come in really handy. Just as they live above their own laws, the world government has figured out how to overcome the natural laws of this world. They can sail through the comm belt on specially built ships and even run stable trade routes through the dangerously unstable Grand Line thanks to their stockpile of eternal poses and control over the Puffing Tom. These accomplishments are genuinely helpful to ordinary people in this world, but all that's just a lucky side effect of their true function, which is to bring all the world's riches to one place where they can fuel the obscenely lavish lifestyles of the celestial dragons. With the perspective we're given across the first 600 chapters of One Piece, visiting this world's city streets, its seats of power, its black markets, and even its prison system, it becomes crystal clear that One Piece's entire economic and political apparatus is really a giant pyramid scheme. One that allows a handful of flabby, egotistical parasites who can't even do their own walking to live like gods, supported by tributes from shifty middle managers who live like kings, while an army of violent authoritarian thugs who think they're superheroes make sure nobody gets in their way. Now, one could read into that as a commentary on a lot of stuff. Oda clearly studied our own world to make his political and law enforcement systems feel believably complex, but I don't just dig his approach to systemic world building because it happens to validate my personal pro-felt agenda. The way the world government is set up, it makes for a very interesting antagonistic force and an engine for strong storytelling unto itself. Some of the best character arcs in the entire series involve marines who genuinely believe in justice trying to reconcile their values with the reality of their job. 
It's all justified well enough through in-universe propaganda that you can absolutely understand how the Admiralty and rank and file might buy into the lies and convince themselves that they are the real heroes. But at the same time, it's easy to grasp how less scrupulous soldiers like Spandam, Lucci, and Hannibal can be motivated by the power the system offers and the opportunities it affords them to abuse it. From our hero's perspective, the world government presents a genuinely challenging problem to solve, one that justifies the near thousand chapters of adventure it's taken to solve it so far. And while that problem has worldwide ramifications, at the same time, Oda does a great job of making it feel intensely personal. The world government stands between Luffy and the unparalleled freedom that is his goal. It directly threatens his friends through its persecution of Nico Robin and the Fishmen. It did some huge spoilers to his immediate family right before the time skip. And it's also in our way as readers who want to better understand this world. The Void Century is a period of history immediately preceding the founding of the world government 800 years ago that nobody is allowed to read, talk, or even think about ever. There are some inconvenient truths about the nature of the world and humanity that the celestial dragons would much rather stay buried with that history literally buried. There are these massive, indestructible stone monoliths called pone glyphs scattered throughout the Grand Line, each of which has a fragment of the true history etched into its surface, and one of the Straw Hats, Nico Robin, is a rogue archaeologist who's trying to track them all down so that she can learn that illegal history for herself, and maybe bring down the government with it. As a world-building geek, I cannot help but stand for Nico Robin. Also, as an intensely horny person. Oh yes! My queen! I love you! But mostly just from a writing perspective, she is a brilliantly conceived hero. Sure, it's a little inorganic, as exposition justifications go, to just have a character whose job it is to find out and explain lore, but when a world is this interesting and bizarre, it's totally believable that somebody in it would just want to spend their whole life exploring and finding out more about it. And seeing Robin's curiosity rewarded provides its own kind of wish fulfillment for me. When Sam Gamgee is all like, Oh, Mr. Frodo, it would do me heart good to hear one more tale of the elves, sir. I relate to him super hard, because I am also thirsty for that elf lore. I want to learn more about this world, and I appreciate that this naive country bumpkin is here to ask incredibly awkward questions so that we can get to that faster. Nico Robin kind of serves the same function in One Piece, but in a way that's actually vital to the plot, and in some contexts makes her more important than Luffy himself. It is always fun to watch her run off and nerd out over the history of the places the Straw Hats visit, and nowhere was that more fun, for me at least, than when they visited Skypea. I love Sky Islands. Uh, Skylands as a concept. Skies of Arcadia has one of my favorite aesthetics of any video game ever. There's just something deeply pleasing about the idea of sailing a ship through clouds. And Oda clearly agrees with that sentiment because he goes absolutely ham in fleshing out this particular setting. Luffy shares in that excitement too. As soon as he realizes what the log pose pointing upward means, he is all about those sky islands and will stop at nothing to reach them. In pursuit of that goal, the Straw Hats visit a dinky little island bay called Jaya, which is occupied on one end by a pirate shantytown, while the other is mostly open jungle where an explorer named Mont Blanc Cricket has made his home. Or, well, half of a home, anyway. Cricket's goal in life is to find a legendary lost city of gold called Shandora that his ancestor, Nolan the Liar, claimed to have found on the island 400 years prior, though he couldn't find it again when he came back. After the Straw Hats help Cricket fend off some less friendly pirates, he agrees to outfit their ship, the Going Merry, with wings that will allow them to ride the Knockup Stream, a massive intermittently occurring ocean geyser, into the stratosphere. 
After a thrilling vertical voyage, the Straw Hats arrive in an entirely new world, the White White Sea, comprised of extra dense clouds. As you'd expect, most of this sea has the properties of water, albeit a little bit less dense. It can support the buoyancy of a regular ship, but not a person swimming through it. But there are also islands of more solid cloud form on which a strange race of people with wings and dealy boppers lives. These Skypeans' entire way of life revolves around excavating various kinds of clouds with unusual properties and shaping them into more useful forms. Supplementing this architecture with technology built using the remains of special cloud-dwelling shellfish called dials. Kind of like how normal seashells are thought to hold the sounds of the ocean, the various dials of the White White Sea are able to store things like sound, fire, kinetic energy, wind, and even clouds. And conveniently, they can release their contents at any time with the press of a button. Transit, entertainment, and warfare in Skypea all rely on this technology, and there's a whole new learning curve the Straw Hats have to go through to figure out how to fight with and against them. They're a particularly great boon to Usopp's arsenal. Anyway, you wouldn't think that there's much to fight over up here because the clouds are pretty abundant, but earthly materials like wood and rock are not, and there happens to be a massive jungle island called the Upper Yard just laying around on the clouds next to Angel Beach where the Skypeans live. Why don't they live on that island, you ask? Because it's been claimed by the Kami, a gang of self-proclaimed gods led by a Buddha-looking devil fruit user named Eneru. The Kami demand worship from the Skypeans, and considering that Eneru can turn into fucking lightning and has very good hearing, they're not in much of a position to decline or even complain. So most of them just accept it and serve the Kami without question. There is a separate rebel force who claim the upper yard as their ancestral homeland and try to fight back against the Kami's occupation, but thus far they haven't really had much luck. Into all this sail the Straw Hats, and of course they immediately throw the whole place into chaos by flaunting the rules because nobody tells Monkey D. Luffy what to do. Eventually, they do have to head to the Upper Yard because Nami, Robin, Zoro, Chopper, and the Going Merry get arrested for crimes against the Kami, and the only way to save them from execution is to complete the deadly trials of the Skybound Jungle. Which is much easier said than done, because the Kami all possess a power called Mantra that allows them to read the emotions of their opponents and predict their movements. Which is secretly even more set up for the eventual reveal of Haki, a whole secondary power system that does as much to define the back half of this series as the Devil Fruits do, if not more so. But here, it's just one more piece of the setting that, combined with cloud sky mines and razor wire and dials, makes for some very novel fights. Of course, no straw hat worth their salt would be content to just sit around waiting for rescue, so while Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji fight off the Kami, their captured companions go wandering into the jungle. And there, while exploring some old ruins, they make a big discovery, the other half of Cricket's house. Turns out, Noland wasn't a liar after all. There was, in fact, a city of gold on Jaya. It was just lifted up into the sky along with most of the island by the knock-up stream sometime after he visited. All of that's explained in exhaustive detail during an extensive flashback, which also fleshes out the culture of the Shandians who are now stuck fighting to reclaim their home from Eneru. Their Mesoamerican-inspired civilization is every bit as complex and fascinating as that of the modern Skypeans, and as Robin later discovers when she digs deeper into their history, it also has surprising ties to the Void Century. So to sum all this up, Oda managed to make angel-inhabited islands in the sky feel entirely plausible within the context of his pirate world, giving those sky islands their own cloud-based culture and multiple centuries of complex religious and political history to build stories off of. He also connected them to the surface in order to unexpectedly complete the arc of someone who seemed like a one-off background character when we first met him, and for good measure, he tied all of that into the biggest mystery in the series. All for what ultimately amounts to one last fun, carefree side adventure before the real One Piece really begins. 
in what other fictional universe could you say that about a story where the main character literally goes up to heaven to kick God's ass? There really is nothing else out there like One Piece. Its world is just awe-inspiring in its sheer breadth, but also in its depth. Somehow every corner of it is uniquely interesting. I know that Oda doesn't really think of everything, but he's a skilled enough illusionist to make it feel as though he has. And he's a skilled enough illustrator, especially with the assistance of his assistants filling in the backgrounds, to make even the zaniest settings he imagines feel tangible and connected to all the rest of it. One Piece's art style is as divisive as it is distinctive. A lot of Western otaku in particular dismiss it out of hand, probably because it reminds them a little too much of the cartoons for kids they came to anime to escape. I know that was what kept me off the series for the longest time until I got over myself and grew up, but even more than his obsessive attention to detail or his passion for natural and human history, that style is what allows Oda's approach to world building to work as well as it does. It's the foundation on which all of the series' kinetic, physics-defying fights are built, and the glue that holds all these wild ideas and aesthetics together. One Piece isn't just a manga that looks kinda cartoony, it's a manga set in a cartoon world. A place where animals can talk if nobody tells them they're not supposed to, things get heavier the bigger they look, even when they're literally full of air, punch strength is determined mostly by wind-up distance, and Usopp's nose can double as a Pinocchio reference and convenient carrying handle because people's appearances comically reflect their inner selves, but also that's just what their physiology is like. Simultaneously, this is a place where millions upon millions of complex human beings with their own faults and strengths dreams and misconceptions have lived full lives, built families, and died across centuries and millennia. Even as his characters follow physical laws that only really make sense within the flat confines of a page or screen, Oda consistently draws them as though they exist within a real, three-dimensional space, paying heed to perspective and blocking so that every moment of action and drama feels chunky and believable. This combination of grounded, realistic, written and visual storytelling sensibility with heightened, stylistic unreality makes even impossible places like Skypea, Enna's Lobby, Fishman Island, and Impel Down seem real, like you could just jump through the panel and be there. It allows for serious, weighty stories about lawful injustice, discrimination, slavery, and the dangers of theocracy to be told within those spaces without feeling out of place. And it allows for stories like that to exist alongside some absolute nonsense without shattering your sense of immersion. Right after Skypea, Luffy and his friends stop over on Long Ring Longland, a ring-shaped archipelago populated by comically stretchy animals, for a brief but thorough homage to wacky races in the Laugh Olympics. There's a whole hundred-man crew of classic cartoon references to contend with, complete with their own Dick Dastardly and Captain Foxy, who keeps accidentally helping the good guys every time he tries to cheat. This arc isn't all fun and games, important setup is sprinkled throughout it. Aokiji's introduction at the end gives us our first taste of the real power of a naval admiral. The Davy backfight is an important piece of pirate culture that establishes the saga's themes of villains bending the rules to their advantage and testing the Straw Hat's bonds. And the tide that gently recedes from Long Ring Long Land every year is the same tide that hits Water 7 not so gently as the annual Aqua Laguna. But for the most part, this is a slice of pure comedy relief sandwiched between the incredibly heavy climax of one saga and the incredibly heavy everything of the next one. An opportunity for Oda to bust out hilarious gags, character designs, and combat concepts that wouldn't work in any other context. It really stretches the idea of what One Piece can be in interesting and unexpected directions, but it doesn't tear or break it. At least not in the manga, the anime does really push it with the filler. 
In its original form, at least, the Davy Back fight still feels fundamentally in step with the rest of the One Piece universe. Even as Luffy goes full Looney Tune, mistakes a man in a cheap plastic mask, lipstick, and heels for a nurse, and makes him pratfall face first into a pit full of swords, you don't really question it. You just laugh and accept it as a small, goofy part of this grand adventure. Because, come on, you've already seen giant Vikings wrestling before an audience of dinosaurs, countless bit villains and henchmen who look like action figures, and by this point, several hundred chapters worth of Usopp and Chopper's doofy faces. This extra layer of silliness just fits as a natural escalation of all that, in the same way that Luffy punching out a despotic god with a ten-ton superconductive metaphor for his own hubris was a natural escalation of 300 chapters worth of increasingly desperate battles. If One Piece didn't look like One Piece, though, it simply would not have worked. And this artistic versatility also makes possible the absolute pinnacle of the pre-time skip series, in my opinion, Thriller Bark. For 48 glorious chapters, the manga transforms into Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, basically, leaving its heroes to be stalked through the spooky halls of a haunted castle and brawl their way through the undead hordes in a creepy countryside that surrounds it in a plot that builds incrementally toward probably the best all-hands-on-deck fight in the series so far. Dark humor and a tense, unnerving atmosphere make this stretch of story insanely memorable, and all it takes to sell the shift in tone is the addition of some heavy blacks to the manga's shading. Now, Thriller Bark probably contributes the least of any One Piece saga to the series' actual world-building, even as it explores the infighting of the Shichibukai and their strenuous relationship with the world government, it's really just building on groundwork laid way back in Alabasta. But its ragtag supporting cast of zombies and shadowless villagers, pulled together from across all the Great Blue Seas, serves as a long-overdue reminder that there is still life and death going on outside the Grand Line, and the mere existence of a place this spooky adds a great deal of texture to the setting overall. One Piece takes place in a wide and wonderful world where anything is both possible and plausible, and Oda reminds us of that infinite possibility every time he takes the Straw Hats off the beaten path to a crazy place like this. He's also keen to include reminders outside the story proper in the gorgeous and often hilarious color illustrations of each chapter. Half of these are just silly sight gags that introduce us to even funnier and more adorable critters, but in the other half they follow their own continuity, chapter to chapter, filling us in on what the supporting characters and even villains of past arcs have been up to since they and the Straw Hats parted ways. Often, these silent side stories take us to as-yet-unseen corners of the Grand Line and beyond, to kooky islands we may one day visit with the Straw Hats, and ones we'll likely never see again. If a place doesn't come up in the main story, we don't learn much about it beyond what would fit into a travel brochure, but given how meticulously Oda crafts the places we do get to see up close, that's enough. I mean, have you visited every interesting place in this world? Just knowing those islands and their inhabitants are out there somewhere, that Gadatsu's gotten into the onsen business, and Eneru's settled in the long-forgotten ancestral city of the Skypeans and Shandorans on the motherfucking moon with an army of robots at his disposal, makes the whole One Piece universe feel that much more real and alive. Because truly convincing world building is as much about what's over the horizon as it is what lies within it. I could keep going, and going, and going. I'm sorry if this all seems a little rambly and all over the place, but it's impossible to discuss the craft behind One Piece's world building, even at a surface level, without also talking about its plot, its characters, its combat, and its art. All of it is interconnected. Sometimes it'll take Oda hundreds of chapters to solve a mystery, but every question about this world does have an answer somewhere. More importantly, those answers can change because this world is alive, in motion, and politically volatile, just like ours. 
This manga is an absolute masterclass in effective and efficient fantasy storytelling. So definitely stay away from it if you know what's good for you. It's already got me. I'm about to reread a whole shit ton of it again to cover Alabasta's story structure, Water 7's tone shift, the Summit War, and probably I'm going to have to defend that Thriller Bark is peak One Piece statement now that I've said it. And I've still got about 400 chapters of new shit left to go. So please go share this video with all of your friends to warn them before it's too late that One Piece is too fucking good. It'll destroy us all. Beware!